Hello, everyone, and welcome to phyloseminar.org, a project supported by the Society of Systematic Biologists. We are in the middle of three talks about phylogenetic approaches to genetic conservation. The last talk was from Arnie Morris. Today we have Catherine Graham, and next we'll have Sandrine Pavuan. I'm grateful to Arne for uh, helping organize this theme session. As I mentioned, today we have a talk from Catherine Graham. Catherine is recognized for analysis of statistical species distribution models, in particular for presence-only data. She's also known for her work on genetic conservation, which is what she'll be describing today. Catherine graduated from the University of Missouri at St. Louis in 2000, and is now an associate professor of ecology and evolution at Stony Brook. Welcome, Catherine, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. So this should be on full screen mode now, is that correct? You're looking great. And everybody can see. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. So I will um, go ahead and get started. And first, I'd like to thank um, the organizers for inviting me. This certainly is going to be fun and an honor. So what I'm going to talk today about is something called, we call beta diversity or turnover. And really, this is defined as the change in species composition across space or time, or at least has been traditionally defined this way. And this is just an example, say, of my star in the middle there. And you can imagine that you have compositional change either from that particular middle star to the lowlands or across a ridge or through a lowland valley to another mountain. And how the context of the communities or the places that you're comparing might influence the type and amount of compositional change that you observe. So beta diversity is basically broadly defined as change in species composition. There's been quite some debate on whether the word beta diversity should be used or the word turnover should be used or the word just simply similarity should be used. And a lot of that debate surrounds the metric that you actually calculate and what you actually calculate. For this talk, I'm going to loosely use the word beta diversity or turnover relatively interchangeably, but define what I'm talking about. So why beta diversity? So there's two reasons to really focus on beta diversity. And one is that mechanisms that generate, um, we can learn about the mechanisms that generate patterns of species richness. And secondly, beta diversity, or the change in species composition across space, is fundamental for conservation planning. It's basically the base of most conservation um, algorithms, such as C-Plan, or different sorts of algorithms like that. And also, studies in beta diversity have been increasing tremendously over time. So just to give you a sense of beta diversity and what people have done with it, this is a very sort of nice paper that demonstrates that you can relate beta diversity to different environmental variables and distance. And this can help start to under, understand or identify the factors underlying spatial patterns of beta diversity. So if you just sort of focus on birds and look in Europe versus Catalonia, you can see that distance influences beta diversity at the scale of Europe, while land cover and other factors seem to predominate at a smaller spatial scale. Beta diversity is also, as I said, fundamental to conservation planning. And what you see here is sort of a summary or research paper that came out by Margulis and Pressy a few years ago, where they go through the process of systematic conservation planning. And in this map are colors, and these colors represent intervals of the percent contribution. So each of these different areas contributes or potentially contributes to conserving all of the species in this region differently. So red pixels or red areas would be very important for conservation, um, whereas light pixels or light areas wouldn't. And so underlying this conservation planning is the notion of complementarity. So they, they have species that complement those that exist within reserves, which is fundamentally beta diversity. And so what does considering phylogenetic relationships add? This is just a wonderful um, tree of life that was recently published by Blair Hedges and his group, but you can imagine your own um, phylogeny, and they are proliferating at a wonderful rate lately. So this is an example of beta diversity. So I have a community one, and I add one species, this little 
orange species and this little green species. And these two species, basically, it's just adding a species. So the difference or the change in beta diversity between community one and community two is the same as between community one and community three. However, if we actually consider the phylogenetic relationships underlying this change, you see that in the case of community three, we've added a distantly related species, whereas we've added a closely related species in community two. So the phylogenetic beta diversity wouldn't be the same, while the beta diversity would. And so the idea is that phylogenetic beta diversity then provides some additional information, which we'll explore in this talk. So the first sort of paper acknowledging this idea of phylogenetic beta diversity, or maybe one of the earlier papers, came from the microbial community. And that's, of course, because they don't <laughs> have such an easy time labeling species with names like we do. And so they are much more likely to rely on the phylogenetic similarity. And basically, you can see in a figure from this paper that you have two different phylogenies, well, the same phylogeny A and B, and in, in, I'm sorry, the same phylogeny, but two communities. So the circles represent species that are in one community, the squares species in another community, and you can see a really different pattern of community composition. So now if you wanted to look at change between the circles and the squares, you would get, you can imagine, very different um, patterns of phylogenetic beta diversity if you considered the situation of community A or the situation of community B. And the way that you actually see how different these are is to relate them to a random model. So is the compositional change between two assemblages different than what you would expect by chance? And that is what's depicted in the bottom panel. So the most common or the original metric to calculate beta diversity or a popular beta diversity metric is the Sorensen index. And the Sorensen index is shown here where SI is the total number of taxa in common to both communities, I and J, and SI and SJ are the total number of species found in community I and J respectively. So this is a very sort of straightforward beta diversity metric. This is simply ported over then to a phylogenetic perspective where in this case, BLIJ is the branch length common in both communities I and J and BLI and BLJ, right, are the total branch lengths of community I and J respectively. And so basically, you can port over the same formulas and ideas that were used for beta diversity into phylogenetic beta diversity. And this realization was also made by um, early on in the ecological research by Simon Ferrier, and he was mapping taxonomic beta diversity. And he noted that the same thing could be done with phylogenetic beta diversity. And in his case, he proposed an expansion of Faith's PD ideas, which we heard a lot about in the previous seminar, and said those could then be used to measure phylogenetic beta diversity. So at about this time, Paul Fine and I got together and we thought, well, this is cool. Let's write a perspective piece sort of suggesting why we might consider beta diversity and what it might give us. And so to sort of really get a feel for what it might contribute, it's nice to work through a hypothetical example. So in this example, we've got two islands that are isolated. We've got two environments on each island formed by a rain shadow, a dry environment and a wet environment. And we've sampled species in each of these two or each of these eight places on these different islands. And those are basically um, mapped below. So that's the setup for the system. And then you can imagine different kinds of clades. And given the kind of clade and the degree of niche conservatism, you would end up with different patterns of phylogenetic beta diversity for within island versus between island comparisons. So if we think about clade one, this is primarily structured by geography and secondarily by habitat. In clade two, you have primary 
structuring by habitat, and then only secondarily by geography. In clade three, you've got structuring by geography or dispersal limitation, but not by habitat. And you have a lot of niche lability. So in clade four, in the fourth clade, you've got structuring by habitat with no dispersal limitation and niche conservatism. And then finally, you have a situation that's all random. So as you walk through these different case scenarios, you can C, or hopefully you were looking at panel C and showing and looking at how the beta diversity changed for within islands versus between islands, depending on the type of clade we were actually looking at. So what I'd like to do now is sort of think about these ideas in the hummingbird system. So this is sort of a case study of my own work where we've been working um, with hummingbirds. Hummingbirds originated in the Western Hemisphere. They have a South American origin and several clades have moved into high elevations. And we want to understand how the diversity is sort of, how the pattern of diversity across this region and what mechanisms might actually influence variation and diversity across gradients. There's two big gradients in South America, but I'll focus mostly on, I'm sorry, in Ecuador, but I'll focus mostly on the Andes Mountains, which presents a very strong elevational gradient. Distribution of hummingbird clades varies across elevations, with hermits being in the lowlands, brilliance and coquettes being at high elevations, emeralds and bees being in the lowlands, but predominantly on the west slope. And finally, emeralds being at mid-elevations. So if we sort of study this system in this beta diversity framework, you can imagine that the Andes presents a strong environmental gradient. So given that certain clades, there might be some niche conservatism, or there is some niche conservatism, and clades might be restricted to certain parts of that environmental gradient, we might expect to see high beta diversity and high phylogenetic diversity as we move across the gradient. In contrast, across a barrier or even isolation, especially if it's a recent barrier, we might expect to see, again, high beta diversity, but in this case, low phylogenetic beta diversity because essentially sister taxa are replacing each other. So we set out to sort of look for these patterns and test these ideas in this Ecuadorian system. We have assemblages from about 200 local sites in Ecuador. Birders are great. <laughs> and then we've got a regional phylogeny, which is extracted from Jim McGuire's recent large phylogeny that he published on hummingbirds. And we know that the functional traits that should influence species occurrence <clears throat> at high elevations are relatively conserved. So now we're going to do is calculate beta diversity. And in this case, I'm using the phylosaur index I introduced earlier. And you would expect that given that there's species in common among communities, that compositional and phylogenetic beta diversity should be highly related. And indeed they are. They are related with a correlation of about 70%. But what we're interested in is cases where potentially phylogenetic beta diversity and compositional beta diversity are decoupled. So we wanted to sort of test our ideas. So we wanted to create a null model to say, well, what would we expect given that there's species in common? So these two types of beta diversity are related. What do we actually observe? And we want to find the situations where we either see greater beta diversity than phylogenetic beta diversity than we expect based on compositional beta diversity or vice versa. So what you see in the right side is a figure where you've got the expected turnover, the observed turnover, and we're taking the tails from the distribution. So each of those represents an instance, represents one one instance of beta diversity between two particular assemblages. And so what I'm going to do on the next slide is actually map those lines. So you're going to be slides, see a slide, a 
of Ecuador with different lines, and each line represents either a situation where one of the two beta diversity components is greater as a function of our hypotheses that we set out that we thought isolation and environment should influence patterns of beta diversity. And so here you see four different figures. You've got isolation and environment, and then you've got situations where phylogenetic beta diversity is less than compositional beta diversity, or less than we would predict based on the null model I just showed you, and situations where phylogenetic beta diversity is greater than compositional beta diversity. And we basically see more or less what we'd expect. In the top panel, we see that situations where phylogenetic beta diversity is less than compositional are mostly on either side of the Andes. So these are basically assemblages on either side of the Andes. In contrast, if you look at panel E, you see situations where you have 87% of, of, the, of the times that this occurred occurring where you have species going across a very strong environmental gradient, which would be from low to high elevations, where you've got phylogenetic beta diversity greater than compositional beta diversity. So we can step back and sort of look at these patterns. So the first pattern we see is phylogenetic beta diversity is highest along elevational gradients, or higher than we would expect given a null model. And the potential mechanism there is radiation, which is consistent with what we think happened with hummingbirds in the Andes Mountains. The second pattern is that phylogenetic beta diversity is lowest across slopes in the lowlands. And here the potential mechanism is likely vicariance, where the mountains actually resulted in isolation and divergence. But divergence of sister taxa, so of divergence of closely, relatively closely related species. Okay, so, so far we've considered one simple metric and looked at some of the ways that people started to use this metric. But there's many, many ways of measuring beta diversity, and this table is made small on purpose because it would be impossible to go through these. Lemon also has a similar um, table. There's other um, reviews of all the different ways that you can actually calculate beta diversity. So we just chose a method in the beginning. And more recently, people have sort of systematically gone back and said, which method should we actually consider to calculate beta diversity and why? Now, of course, the answer to this is dependent on the question. But given a question, there are certain guidelines that we can consider. So sort of pose the question, is beta diversity, as measured by the Sorensen metric, the best way to measure turnover? Right, and so that's the Sorensen metric that I showed before. B, are species that are in one assemblage and not the other. C, are species that are in assemblage C but not B. And A, then, are species that are in both assemblages. There's two issues with this metric. One is it doesn't distinguish nestedness or turnover. It doesn't let you know which species are actually new or changing between assemblages. And it's also could can be strongly influenced by differences in richness. And so what you see on the right is a paper by Baselga, a figure from a paper by Baselga, where he sort of breaks down these issues. So you can see you have sites in panel A, you've got sites A1, A2, A3. And basically A1 has all the species, A2 has some species, and A3 has fewer of the species. This is a pattern of nestedness, which is strongly influenced by species richness. In the second case, panel B, you've got the same three sites, or three sites, and here you've got replacement of three species in each site. This would be spatial turnover, so actually new species that occur in a given site that don't occur, say, in B2. In the next case, you have a combination of nestedness and turnover. And so what Baselga points out is that it might be nice to know what part of beta diversity is a function of nestedness and what part of beta diversity is a function of turnover. And finally, there can be an influence of species richness, and so the bottom panel is just to demonstrate that. 
And so this Sorensen index that we were using, or people were using, basically includes both nestedness and turnover. So what he suggested in this paper is that we can break this down into two components. So B sor is the total one, and that actually equals B sim, which is pure turnover, or sometimes called narrow sense turnover, and this nestedness component, which is a function of species richness. I won't go through these formulas in detail in the interest of time, but you see the top one we saw in the previous slide, and that's considered broad sense turnover, or total turnover. In the next one, you have pure species turnover. So this is a formula that's going to sort of pick up only those species that are uniquely in one site or the other. So additions and subtractions of species. And finally, the nestedness component are those that are where you have one community with a large number of species and a second assemblage where you have a subset of that larger assemblage. And that's the nestedness component. And so this is pretty cool. We now have three components of beta diversity. And depending on our question, we can choose which one we might want to consider. And so that was for compositional beta diversity. In a more recent paper, Le Pur and colleagues ported this over to phylogenetic beta diversity. And so basically, if you have a phylogeny with branch lengths, which are denoted as Ws, you have sort of PD, or phylogenetic diversity, total equal to the branch length that is represented by two assemblages, TJ and TK. So then PDK, or the phylogenetic diversity associated with assemblage K, would be the sum of the branch lengths of all the species that are in assemblage K, and likewise for assemblage J. And so we now have these components that we can define associated with A, B, and C, as you see here. So P would be, B would be PB tolt minus PBK. So the total phylogenetic diversity represented by both communities minus those in just one of the two communities. And C should be self-explanatory given B. And then A is just the total. So it's PDK plus PDJ minus PD tolt. And so this then gives us the B, C, and A that we can plug in to these formulas that we see on the previous slide from this slide and now create phylogenetic turnover in a broad sense, and then also have the narrow sense component and the nestedness component. And this is just one more example of that. To get it in your head, um, and then I can go through it quickly, but this is again from that same paper where they're showing these different communities, A through F, where they're adding species, and you can see below, say, when you compare A to B, that you have a value for phylosaur, which is the total one, and then they have the phylosaur turnover and the phylosaur PD, right? And you see it's zero in the case from A to B, but if you look at the case from A to C, all of a sudden phylosaur PD has a value because you have some nestedness. So what use has this given us? What have people done with this? Well, probably one of the most predominant examples is a reclassification of Wallace's bioregions or Wallace's regions. And Holton Lassard in this particular study decided to calculate pure turnover. Um, I'm sorry, and their colleagues decided to calculate pure turnover. And pure turnover is just then those species that are turning over. It doesn't have the nestedness component. And they use this to pretty much create um, a new map of Wallace's regions. From a conservation perspective, they also, or one could delineate regions that are smaller. There's no reason to sort of stick to these very broad regions. This is an example for frogs or for amphibians, I'm sorry, where they've basically defined 26 different regions. And these regions could then be used to sort of consider conservation planning, or do we have conservation units in all of these areas that we think harbor distinct evolutionary um, sets of species. So phylogenetic beta diversity has served us in many ways. 
but recently people have started to add also functional or morphological beta diversity and started to ask what can we learn if we actually simultaneously compare these three dimensions of beta diversity. Of course, this has been fueled a bit by the dimensions of diversity um, proposal or program at the National Science Foundation. And so most of the work so far, as I said before, has been on phylogenetic beta diversity. And this is an example where you see um, distance decay relationships. And I wanted to put this up here simply to say that we might expect to see different patterns of phylogenetic beta diversity in different groups. And so this is a situation with microbes on A and angiosperms in B. And you can see the distance decay in angiosperms is what you would expect based on a null model, while the distance decay in bacteria is less than that, suggesting you have very, very strong turnover patterns in bacteria, so very different communities as you change elevation. And so the question then becomes, not only should we consider these different components of beta diversity um, for a given group, but it eventually will be interesting to compare across a lot of groups. So going back then to these different dimensions of diversity, I suggested maybe functional beta diversity could be another um, consideration that we also brought up in our paper in 2008, where we talked about um, beta diversity, phylogenetic beta diversity. So if you just see that very simple diagram, you've got phylogenetic distance on the y-axis and trait distance on the x-axis. If traits are completely conserved, then you would expect that phylogenetic distance and trait distance would basically give you exactly the same thing or very similar patterns. In contrast, if they're divergent, such that you have different trait, dis di trait values that aren't dependent on the phylogenetic relatedness, you might expect something like convergent evolution is playing an important role. So this is why it might be fun to consider all three dimensions simultaneously. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, compositional beta diversity is the number of species shared between two assemblages. Phylogenetic beta diversity is then the branch length shared between two assemblages. And morphological or functional beta diversity is a trait similarity shared between two assemblages. Now, as I go forward, I'm going to speak about morphology and function sort of in the same breath. But obviously, attributing function to morphology is a challenge. And coming up with the correct functional traits, say, for to test conversion evolution is also a challenge, which needs a lot of consideration. But given that our next philo seminar is focused on the functional aspects. I will sort of gloss over that for now and assume or hope it's covered by the next speaker. So why might these dimensions differ? Well, compositional di beta diversity could be influenced by recent and historic isolation or environmental differences. For phylogenetic, we expect potentially a strong signature of historical isolation. For traits, we would expect, given a certain degree of niche lability, that they could actually be more influenced by environmental differences or local adaptation. And so I want to explore these ideas just a little bit in mammals. Mammals are chosen because it's an enormous clade with tremendous diversity of um, function and relatedness patterns. So I'll answer two questions. So she did, what are the drivers of global beta diversity dimensions in mammals? The first one will ask, what is the relative influence of evolutionary history and environment on trait beta diversity? Its focus is actually on the trait and phylogenetic dimensions. Well, the second one will ask, will build on the first one and ask, how do ecological and evolutionary mechanisms shape beta diversity patterns in different places in the globe? So it will refine the first question. So the data used in both of these studies was presence absence data for 5,000 terrestrial mammals based on suitability maps from Carlos Rondini, the newly compiled mammal tree from Blair Hedges from 2015, 
and then a series of different traits from Pantheria and then four other sources where we used imputations to obtain information on traits we didn't have and then environmental data. So the data diversity that we calculated is the pure component and we calculated it off of distances. So we basically turn species into Euclidean distances, traits using PCA into Euclidean distances, phylogenetics into cophenetic distances, and environment again into Euclidean distances. And we're basically going to measure something called um, MNTD turn, which is described by this formula. And it basically is the minimum mean distance between the species present in two assemblages. And it's measuring that pure component of beta diversity. And for global studies, I think this is critical because you have such differences in species richness that you don't want um, the nestedness and richness component to come into play. And then I'll be showing you two different kinds of results. One is an ordination. Basically, we can take these distance matrices put them into an ordination and you get these wonderful maps and take that ordination and map it. And you get wonderful maps where colors that are more similar have similar species composition. And then we can also try to map it in a different way where basically a value in a given pixel is the mean turnover to all other cells. So the first question, we came up with a couple hypotheses. Phylogenetic trait conservatism is the first one. So this suggests that trait and phylogenetic beta diversity, given trait conservatism, should be strongly correlated. The opposite would be ecological adaptation, where evolutionary labile traits and selective pressures to adapt to environmental conditions prevail. And then we would expect that trait and phylogenetic beta diversity should not be strongly correlated. And the trait beta diversity in particular should be strongly associated with environmental conditions. So we did this analysis globally with two degree grid cells. We used a variance partitioning me method on our distance matrices, where a trait is a function of the environment and the phylogeny. And to understand whether we had significant patterns, we compared our results to null models, randomizing species names in, the distribution, in distribution, phylogeny, and traits where richness and taxonomic beta diversity were fixed. And so first I'll just show you some of these ordination maps. So these are maps of beta diversity for traits, phylog phylogeny, and environment. The phylogenetic beta diversity map shown here strongly resembles that created by the Wallace project I talked about earlier, especially the map that's in the subdocs, or actually maybe it's in the document for um, mammals. So our results are consistent with previous work, which is good because the authors are the same, some of them. So what we can see looking at these maps is that geograph there is some geographic structure in beta diversity. There's a lot of homogeneity across the northern hemisphere, which might be sort of predictable given the connectivity of those regions through time. The Australian and Madagascar regions seem to be quite distinctive. And there's also some congruence between trait and phylogenetic beta diversity and environmental conditions. If we look at the results of our variance partitioning methods, where we're looking at trait as a function of environment and phylogeny, we see a few things. First, so I'm, what I'm showing you are partial R squareds, and then I'm showing those, those results as effect um, mapped with what we would expect based on null results or a random model. So the strength of association between trait and phylo phylogenetic beta diversity explains a lot of the partial R squared, but it's not actually any different than what you would expect by random. In contrast, trait beta diversity was consistently more strongly associated with environmental turnover than you would expect based on random. And there also seems to be an important contribution of shared phylogenetic and, and environmental um, information. So our main results then is that global mammal trait beta diversity is not more strongly associated with phylogenetic beta, beta diversity than you would expect by chance. Instead, it appears that ecological adaptation and environmental filtering may influence mammal community trait composition across the globe. 
And so then we wanted to ask, well, where across the globe? What are the specific mechanisms? And so we have this question, how do ecological and evolutionary mechanisms shape beta diversity in different places? And so to simplify this problem, we defined realms associated with geographic distance and isolation, so as a surrogate for that, and biomes as our environmental units. And this is a series of hypotheses that we predicted based on low and high values of phylogenetic and trait beta diversity and when they should actually occur. So we would expect that in most cases, high values of both phylogenetic and trait beta diversity occur if pairs of cells are both in different biomes and different realms because of historical isolation and environmental filtering. At the opposite, we expect low values of phylo and traits if cell pairs are in the same realm and same biome because there's no dispersal limitation and the environment is similar. However, if pairs are in the same realm but very different environments, we still might expect relatively low phylogenetic beta diversity because there's not a huge amount of isolation, but we might expect higher trait beta diversity as a function of environmental filtering. And finally, cell pairs in similar environments, but different realms, we expect to see low trait and high phylogenetic beta diversity. And this would mostly be a function of convergent structure of isolated assemblages. So basically, we take all pairs in the globe, all pairs of cells in the globe across the world, and assign them to a biome and a realm, and then use these to make these comparisons. And the comparisons are simply going to be TS. So we did this at a one degree scale. So that's about 70 million pairwise comparisons that um, my very clever graduate student postdoc figured out how to calculate. <laughs> we assigned pairs, pairs of, that would be Ben Weinstein and, and working with Katerina Peron, who's the lead author on this. Well, they're both lead authors. They assigned pairs of cells to biomes and realm combinations. And then we compared beta diversity and phy phylogenetic beta diversity and trait beta diversity based on these four combinations. So this is just a map of mean beta global beta diversity for phylogenetic beta diversity, um, trait beta diversity, and taxonomic diversity. And this is basically for every pixel, the mean beta diversity to every other pixel. And these are kind of cool because you see very quickly that taxonomic beta diversity shows something very different than phylogenetic beta diversity, for instance, where in phylogenetic beta diversity, the very unique lineages that occur in Australia, Madagascar, and then in Southern South America pop out, whereas that's not apparent in taxonomic beta diversity. Next, if we look at the combinations of realm and biome and try to make sense of these patterns, we note that the dotted line represents the whole data set. And we can see that cell pairs that were located in different realms showed higher phylogenetic beta diversity than the whole data set. And cell pairs within realms showed lower phylogenetic beta diversity. Cell pairs located in the same biomes showed lower trait beta diversity than the whole data set. And interestingly, cell pairs in different realms, thus isolated assemblages, showed higher phylo beta diversity, but low trait beta diversity, so that right-hand bar in the first graph, suggesting convergent structure of isolated assemblages. So next, I want to show you the maps of these actual combinations that we mapped. So they show specific combinations that are in accordance with our hypothesis. So as expected, there's lots of cases where dimensions are coupled. And this is the blue map and the orange map. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> same biome, same realm. And then different biome, different realm. So I'm opposite the gray map and the light orange map. The blue map shows the convert that shows situations where convergence is found. And this is mainly in tropical forests. And we hypothesize this might be linked to the fact that tropical forests are more stable and old biomes 
have had a long time for colonization and specialization and res have resulted in fuller niche space filling potentially. And so this is sort of driven to um, or resulted in these patterns of convergent evolution. We expected deserts to come out and it could be that our realm or our biome definition of deserts is tricky because deserts really vary in terms of um, the environment. So desert biome can be very, very cold and dry versus very wet and dry. I'm sorry, very cold and dry versus very warm and dry, which actually um, we think has meant that it doesn't really make sense as a biome and maybe should be considered differently. So from these analysis, we can see that global mammal beta diversity dimensions are not strongly coupled. We have contrasting patterns for different biomes. Environmental filtering, historical isolation seem to shape global beta diversity patterns through diversal, dispersal limitation, adaptation, and selection. We like our hypothesis testing framework and sort of setting out these a priori hypotheses about what we might expect to happen. And we think this maybe could be applied to other clades or more generally. And you can also see a very nice paper by Ben Weinstein in the American Naturalist, where we used a somewhat similar approach for hummingbirds. And beta diversity maps should help conservation decisions by identifying similar and unique places globally. So can we use beta diversity, these three different beta diversity um, dimensions for conservation planning? you know, to sort of plug in to these conservation algorithms that have been refined and seem to do a really good job of capturing unique areas of compositional diversity. So these methods are based on the principle of complementarity and comp they basically require that diver diversity be reported as a feature in each cell. Last talk, we heard some ways that this could be done using phylogenetic diversity, some very creative ideas that Arnie and his students were exploring. But really, putting a feature in a grid, if you're talking about phylogeny, really is a bit tricky. So can we apply these sort of algorithms to different dimensions of diversity? We certainly want to be able to, because we've seen that they're not different I mean, I'm sorry, that they're not coupled and that we can understand a little bit about why they're not coupled. So not only are they not coupled, we understand a little bit about the underlying history of isolation and environment leading to their decoupling. So there's been one attempt I could find, or one nice attempt I'll show you that has tried to do this. And this is based on fish in the lower Colorado basin. And basically you've got taxonomic features, which are species occurrence, and that's usually what is used in these analysis is a list of species per grid. You basically take, find the grid or the unit in this case, the landscape unit that has the most species, and then you ask, well, where in the landscape is a grid cell that has the most species that aren't in the one we just chose, right? So that's a very simple sort of way you can walk through and pick each grid cells that each grid cell you choose adds to the total diversity that you're conserving across all the different grid cells, right? So it's different than going and just picking the most species rich places, because if you did that, you might end up with the same species in the two places you chose. So the notion of complementarity is to each time choose the species, the grid cell with the most unique set of species or the unit of of the geographical unit you're looking at. So how do you do this? Or how do they do this for function and phylogeny? Well, so for functional features, they decided they would bin traits. And so each unit then has, you have this trait, this sort of part of this trait feature or not. And for phylogenetic features, they used nodes. Is a given node represented in this particular um, area or not? So this is a sort of way to take functional and phylogenetic data and try to put it in the same framework um, or the same system as the taxonomic features so that things like zonation or C plan can be um, applied or max ran can be applied to identify the units that should be put into some sort of a conservation plan. And so this is just 
then a result of their prioritization schemes based on taxonomic, phylogenetic, and functional. So this is the prioritization um, schemes. And this is the difference. So if you look at the prioritization screen from scheme from taxonomic and subtract phylogenetic, you get situations where you have a mismatch, where either phylogenetic seems to be chosen and not um, taxonomic or vice versa. And you can sort of look at these different combinations and see that there's mismatches across these different dimensions of diversity, suggesting that it would actually be useful to consider all three in conservation planning if you would want to conserve both taxonomy function, which might relate to ecosystem services, and then phylogenetic, which would then represent evolutionary history. And so we've started to try to do this with a, grad a visiting graduate student, um, Fernando Broom, and a postdoc who has now left my lab, but who is here, Anna Davidson, for all um, the mammals of the world, given that we noticed that there was decoupling. And what you see is a prioritization scheme for species for phylogeny, and in this case, we're actually using an eigenvector um, analysis or result to actually not nodes because we wanted to use branch lengths. So we're using eigenvectors, and I won't go into details there. And then traits, again, binned. We've done a lot of sensitivity analysis, and no matter how much how you slice up the traits or the phylogeny, we end up with similar maps. And then if we overlay the three dimensions, we can ask, given a global prioritization scheme, how much concordance is there? And the dark green you see in map D are situations where you have all three dimensions concordant. But you also have a lot of orange where only one of the dimensions seems to be represented. And so this is a work in progress. But given that this talk was about conservation, I wanted to show how we might include phylogenetic diversity and also trait diversity um, into the very typically used conservation algorithms that are used to de design prioritization schemes. So my grand conclusions then are that biodiversity should be extended to consider phylogenetic and other dimensions such as trait and functional and any other dimensions people want to think up. Um, evaluating the correspondence between these dimensions leads to new insights about the mechanisms influencing diversity patterns. And I showed you several examples of that both with um, hummingbirds and then later with mammals. And that given that different dimensions appear influenced by different mechanisms, then conservation priorities or conservation schemes should consider all of these dimensions. And we sort of explored one way that one might use the very sort of popular and effective conservation um, planning softwares or methods such as seed plan and zonation all of which are fundamentally based on complementarity, which is fundamentally beta diversity, how we might apply those to these different dimensions. I'll just end by, ask, by hopefully acknowledging all the different um, project participants. There's some postdocs, Katerina Pernoni, Juan Pada, Anna Davidson, and Ben Holt. Graduate students who've worked on different aspects of it are Ben Weinstein, Anton Machak, and then two students that visited from Brazilian labs, Bruno, Ferreira and Fernando Broom. Collaborators, um, many of these are from a Dimensions project that I'm lucky enough to be a part of. Those would be Gabriel Costa, Bruce Young, Wilker Radeloff, and Sarah Hedges. And then also some other people who have been quite influential, Karsten Rabak and JP Lissard. And then of course, the many co-authors on some of the papers I talked about today. And I'm funded from the National Science Foundation, NASA, and National Geographic, and I thank them. And that is it. Oops, more acknowledgments from a different Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, so I think we'll do some questions now. So if you do have a question, go ahead and type it into this little questions box on the side, which you should be able to get to by clicking on the left-hand side with the Q&A button. Mm -hmm. um, I, I definitely have some questions. It was quite interesting to me uh, having some experience with the uh, the microbial perspective to hear, you know, more about mammals and, and birds and so on. Um, what I've got a couple of overall questions. So, why would we want to conserve taxonomy? 
versus phylogeny. I mean, we've heard a lot about conserving, like PD measures for conserving phylogenetic diversity, but what, what in your mind does taxonomy add? <laughs> it's interesting from a microbial perspective, given that you have a hard time labeling things, certainly um, that's tricky. I think from a purely logistical perspective, taxonomy matters because people care about species. They care about things. They like to put things in bins, count them, and conserve them. And they're much less comfortable conserving an evolutionary branch length or a bill length. So, I mean, I think to some perspective, you could sort of sit back and say, maybe we don't need this. But to the extent that we want to conserve every entity, and then you do need it because there you don't have strict correspondence between the three. Yeah, yeah, you don't. But I mean, I guess I mean one thing one could be said is that the taxonomy is some like noisy measure of the functional diversity. That it, they're sort of like the the categories that people come up with by looking at how these you know what these these species look like and so on. But, yeah, I mean, I realized from a from a microbial perspective, it seems silly, um, a little bit, right? But uh, yeah, I think people definitely relate to species. Yeah, uh, I mean, and getting people to relate is certainly an important thing for the. Uh, conservation. And I and I think also taxonomists have done a lot of good work, sort of identifying these unique units that. We can argue about what a species is, but that sort of generally we can agree that they're interesting units, that species are interesting units yeah. to conserve. Um, I was also curious, so uh, you talked a lot about null models mm -hmm. for sort of a phylogenetic diversity and trait evolution, for instance. So what what is the state of the art for non-null models? I mean, like, I mean, are there models that are sort of doing things like saying, well, if we have a, a mountain range that's of not necessarily a certain height, but with a, sort of a certain amount of separation, this is how different we expect the functional distances to be or something like that? Yeah, so when we, when we actually, in the study, when we were looking at mammals and trying to sort of ask the extent to which trait evolution, or tra I'm sorry, trait beta diversity was influenced by environment versus um, versus phylogeny. We're not actually using species in that. Well, we're using species because traits belong to species, but we're not actually explicitly using species and sort of factoring that in. Um, but you still need a null model because you can get a pattern that could just be random. Right. You either need a null model or some sort of other sort of Bayesian perspective to, or likelihood perspective mixed model approach to look at it, which haven't really been developed. No, I agree uh, with the importance of null models. I'm just saying, what about non-null models? Like, what about sort of more predictive models? Or yeah, I guess that we haven't gotten there yet. So you're sort of saying make the prediction ahead and test it. I, I guess people aren't quite comfortable with making a prior predictions about beta diversity or phylogenetic beta diversity yet. I mean, we've, most papers say we explore the patterns of these things. It gets the vast majority of papers. We've tried to say, well, we're going to explore the patterns, but we actually have some a prior expectations, which is already, I think, a step ahead. But to actually have them predictive. Well, even not even predictive, but sort of, yeah, uh, well, I guess it's predictive, but it's sort of forward time that there's some generative model of how the functional diversity comes about, for instance. Well, certainly people have looked at climate change and asked how phylogenetic and functional diversity might change. And I chose not to talk about those in the interest of time, but that would be a case where you're, um, well, it's not still not really predictive. You're sort of predicting what it might look like. And I guess if you went back in time, then you could, especially with functional diversity, you could relate that to the fossil record and maybe start to get prediction there. Um, it was also really cool to see uh, like uh, this sort of exploration of something that is 
implicitly there and for a lot of the uniform comparisons, which is this assumption that the taxonomic, uh, sorry, not the taxonomic, but the uh, functional and the phylogenetic beta diversities have some uh, relationship between them. Um, and, you know, thinking about what that actually means. Uh, yeah, I wish we could do some more of that in sort of the microbial world, but I mean, I guess the point is that it's very difficult to measure functional properties of microbes. Uh, I, I suppose that wasn't a very interesting question, but um, need to see. So we do have a question from Basil Iannone. I'm sorry if I've mangled that name. Uh, and he or she asks, uh, what are your thoughts on how using different metrics of phylogenetic diversity, e.g. phylogenetic species variability or phylogenetic species clustering, would affect patterns of phylogenetic beta diversity? And actually, while I have you interrupted, do you, would you mind uh, turning off your screen sharing and then hopefully your... Uh, I should turn it off. Hopefully your your camera will come back. Oh, I see. Ah, there we are. OK, good. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So, so uh, does that question make sense? I'm sorry. Sort of, could you repeat it, please? Uh, so what are your thoughts on how using different metrics of phylogenetic diversity, e.g. phylogenetic species variability or phylogenetic species clustering, would affect patterns of phylogenetic beta diversity? I'm not sure I completely understand the question, unfortunately. I think they're referring to, when you say clustering, that would be, you'd have to be clustering by something. Phylogenetic species clustering. I'm I'm actually not sure what that means. Maybe. So I guess by is it by phylogenetic species variability, do they mean something like PSC, that index? So these sort of indices that are more created with lists of communities and then clustering those? I'm sorry. Maybe maybe uh, Isa can clarify for us, and I'll just ask another quick question, which is, um, why, I, uh, I mean, I'm used to Unifrac. I was just mm -hmm. wondering, like, what is, like, why did you end up developing Phylosaur? Or like, what's the, like, is, is there some obvious difference that I should know about? No, there's no, so Unifrac is Jacquard's and Phylosaur is Sorensen's. The difference between them is one is you have A weighted by two and one you don't. So one weights A twice as much, the A term twice as much as the other. So they're the same thing. This is really a difference in communities that we're not talking to each other. And I, when I wrote this paper with Paul Fine, um, I was inspired by a talk by Donahue to think about phylogenetic beta diversity. And I'd also been talking with Simon Ferrier and, and had read his papers. And I wrote an NSF that failed. And so I decided to write a ecology book. I submitted it, assumed it would fail, and wrote an ecology letters paper because I thought it was a cool idea, and Paul Fine joined me, which was fun. And when we finished the paper and submitted it, I realized that there was a response from Dan Faith and the microbial people saying, why did you not cite us? Which was a clear, um, terrible mistake. And I, I then was, I noted, going to give a talk in Colorado the next week where I met them. <laughs> and I, apologized profusely and they forgave me. Well, they were actually quite lovely, um, Rob Knight and Catherine Lapunzi. And then we organized a special session at ESA where we invited both microbial and non-microbial people to think about beta diversity. But it was it was truly, it's truly just two communities not communicating and Unifrac or whatever the microbial people calling it, not coming up in keyword search, searches that an yeah. ecologist would use. And there's nothing about the title of that paper that you would necessarily get it if you did a search. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. So I think it's just that we're not, you know, the microbial community, normal, like non-microbial ecologists are much more aware of microbial ecologists now, but, you know, even, obviously these papers were probably being written, you know, 2006, if they're published in 2008 or thought about then, yeah. even that, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't as clear, you know, these communities were much more separated. Yeah, uh, so Basil's responded, but just before, about that again. Um, I did want to ask, has there been anything 
it seems like there's the, there's the possibility of being some sort of, there being some sort of arrows theorem or something like that for phylogenetic beta diversity measures like uh, if like have people sort of started with an axiomatic characterizations of the features that you would want to have in a phylogenetic beta diversity thing and then seeing if any of the measures actually have exactly those yeah so there hasn't been so actually creating features is a tricky thing right so you're sort of so that's why applying sort of these conservation schemes to to phylogenetic beta diversity is tricky um dina's i'm going to say his wrong Fijio, the brazilian guy that's, that's terrible um has developed with his colleagues something they call phylogenetic eigenvectors which are supposed to summarize phylogenetic information across the tree in fewer um, components, if you will. And so we've toyed with using those eigenvectors. And we and the first ones explain more of the variation in the phylogeny. And so we've used, say, 10, but we've tried using 20 or 40, and it, it doesn't really matter. So that's how we're trying to get. But I think that's the only way that, that it's been done. And, and similar work was done by um, Gittleman and Stevens in a mammal paper as well, where they were using those eigenvectors to try to get a different kind of measure that might represent comp a compositional, something you could sort of use for um, for beta diversity, basically. Well, not so much for beta diversity is fine. It's when you're actually applying those conservation algorithms, you have a problem, which is the mainstay of how conservation biologists make decisions about prioritization, right? Zonation, all of these different softwares that optimize feature um, representation across a region. So phylogeny has to be turned into a feature, which is super tricky. As it's the same problem with traits. Does that answer your question? Hey, I was asking something slightly different. Oh, that's sorry. rather interesting, but uh, that's that's fine. Um, well, let's go back to Basil. Um, and there's a clarification, which is I'm referring to the fact that you use faith measure of phylogenetic distance to explore measure beta diversity. How would patterns be affected if you instead relied on PSV, PSC, and PSE proposed by Helmus? And maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about what, what those are, because I, I don't know what that is. OK, so there's these, these other metrics, which are PS. So you know what most people know what the net relatedness index is, and that's um, it's a community phylogenetics metric, so it's describing the standing variation in a given place. So PD is also measuring, or it's measuring something about the relatedness of species in a given place. PD is measuring something similar, and PSV is measuring something similar. The underlying ideas under PSV are different um, and potentially less influenced by um, richness, richness patterns. And so that could be why she's asking um, this question. Um, so Helmus and Ives have developed uh, an approach where they, which I think is very, is quite elegant, based on PSV, where they sort of sort out the difference between phylogenetic and compositional dissimilarity, and they, um, they, they have sort of a null modeling approach, like we use with phyl Phylosaur, that's more elegant, that's actually built into their, um, to their approach, which I really like, but I don't actually know how much their measure is measuring um, is influenced by nestedness or these other components. And I don't think anybody's done the math to figure that out. Because theirs is much more sort of based on um, a model of Brownian motion in the phylogenetic tree. So it's, a, it's an extremely different way of sort of calculating things than sort of isolating an A, B, and C, which is sort of what is being plugged into those beta diversity metrics. Yeah. So I think there's some interesting, it'd be nice if they were, to, they, if they would answer that question for it, but there's interesting sort of advancements that could be there. In some ways, it's still sort of early days with understanding how to best um, put beta diversity, phylogenetic beta diversity on the map and how to best deal with it. Well, certainly mapping it is ridiculously difficult because you have the challenge of, um, well, what we did was make an ordination and say which places are similar, which is the same thing that was done in, is the same idea from regionalization type approaches to create regions. 
Um, but actually mapping beta diversity is tricky, right? And so a lot of times people also use distance decay, which is then limited by the distance that you use. Um, so it's, it's actually a tricky, a tricky problem. But that's not answering this person's questions. But I, I guess I don't actually have a good answer for her because I don't think anybody's sort of really systematic, and certainly I haven't systematically compared the math for beta diversity. Interesting. Swinson did a little bit of it, but he didn't, but the, the methods that Ives and Helmas had were not published at the time that Swenson did his comparison of different beta diversity metrics. Yeah, I like that breakdown of the nestedness. I mean, it's clear that there's a lot, uh, there's a lot that gets sort of boiled down into it, uh, that, that number. Yeah, certainly. Well, I guess it's the case with any diversity measure. Like if you think of the alpha ones, PD, and NRI, and TI, there's just, they all have sort of different assumptions. They're going to highlight different aspects and be influenced by different violations or different attributes of the data, I should say. Mm. <laughs> well, like richness is always a big problem, right? It's a, it's a feature, not a bug. OK. Yeah. Um, well, that was great. Uh, thank you very much for the very clear and interesting talk and I guess we'll see people uh, sometime soon I can't remember exactly when for Sandy and have one so yeah. all right thanks again thank you